speak his name softly, Tutankhamun. Treasured antiquity, sealed in a tomb. Now weave us a tapestry, silver and gold. Sing us a song of him, centuries old. Good evening. This is Orson Welles. Grandmother's patchwork quilt and that old rocking chair up in the attic we think of them as antiques. But what then shall we call the fabled treasure of King Tut, of Tutankhamun? To us, a century, a hundred years, seems quite a span of time, quite a sizable piece of history. But in Egypt's history, time is not counted in hundreds, but in thousands. And when this boy, who was a king and a god, died at 19, 3,000 years ago and more, his world was already almost unthinkably old. From the National Gallery in Washington, our television cameras will attempt in some measure to shorten the distance between his world and ours, to close in on some of the minute detail of that extraordinary culture which blossomed out of the desert so mysteriously so long ago and with such staggering beauty. Remarkable photo murals, such as the one behind me, Early photographs of discovery taken in 1922 will, I guess, on occasion, jolt us back to the reality of the 20th century. The land is Egypt, and a pharaoh with a crook and flail and the scepter of mighty power ruled those ancient cities along the Nile and played a game called Senate and cried, perhaps, in a darkened palace room, wondering if he really was both king and god at eight or nine years old. His name was Tutankhamun, King Tut. He was buried here in the Valley of the Kings, and the world would have forgotten him if it hadn't been for the astounding treasure found in his burial chamber. The murals that exhibit these early black and white photos were made at the time of the discovery. The archeologist who in 1922 made this monumental find was Howard Carter an Englishman who'd been searching for such a tomb for more than six years. Here's Lord Carnarvon, another member of the cast, an English peer who devoted the last years of his life to the project. And Harry Burton, who made hundreds of photographs of the precise moment of discovery with equipment we now look upon as very primitive. This is the site of the tomb. Carter was to save it later. I must have trenched only yards from this spot at least twice over the past six years. Rubble covered the entire area, obliterating any sign of the sepulchre for centuries. Then early one morning in November, digging in this ancient city of Thebes, workmen came across a stone step leading down, and Carter knew he had a find. The dig began in earnest. Sixteen steps led down to a sealed entrance. Patiently, carefully, rock by rock, the passageway was cleared and the tomb opened. Can you see anything? Whispered Carnarvon. Yes, Carter replied. Wonderful things. And out of the nightshades of millennia came some 5,000 objects of the young pharaoh's reign. What is it about young boys that's so disarming? They look at you with eyes that ask no questions, reveal no guile. They deal in simple truths, the eyes of boys. And this is the one with a funny name. 3,000 years ago, he was a king, and they called him King Tutankhamun. 
And we call him King Tut because his name is so impossible for us to pronounce. I've known him, this rather special boy, since my own childhood. And you know, for me, the cracked facade of that gentle face and the stylized head in no way impairs his royal grace and bearing. The base of the statue is in the form of a blue lotus that symbolizes an Egyptian view of original creation. The boy is shown as the infant sun god emerging from the lotus, floating on the waters of chaos. It was carved out of some ancient wood, and over this there was a thin layer of plaster, and then it was painted. The result is a most revealing and realistic portrait. Her pierced lobes, her earrings, full sensitive lips, big luminous eyes. As Shakespeare said of another Egyptian monarch, age cannot wither her, nor custom change her infinite variety. You'll notice a large separation in the wood running down the length of the head, shrinkage from drying. Tutankhamun was a relatively unimportant ruler, and the facts about him are very scant. When he came to power some 3,000 years ago, he was eight or nine, and his life was very short. There's a good deal of speculation and mystery about his death, but all we really know is that he was 18 or 19 when it happened. His tomb was modest in size, but richly furnished, laden with varied articles and ornamented with a panoply of royal life. And because of this array of artistic splendor, Egyptologists are able to color in, so to speak, the sketchwork of earlier discoveries. This is a window opening on the substance and quality of ancient Egyptian life. Again, the discovery date, November 1922. This is the condition in which he found the materials in the first antechamber. A certain amount of confusion, he writes, but orderly confusion. Funeral wreaths, 3,000 years old, jars and inlaid boxes with brilliantly colored designs. It took Carter 10 years to restore and record all of the items. And in these oblong containers, roast duck, the young pharaoh's favorite for the long journey into the other world. Now, the treasure. You're going to be able to see the detailed work, often microscopic views, with far greater definition there in your living room than you would at a museum. What do these hieroglyphs say? Listen to a poet of ancient Thebes. May your car, your spirit, live. And may you spend millions of years, you who love Thebes, sitting with your face to the north wind, your two eyes beholding happiness. The young king's drinking cup, 1,300 years before the birth of Christ, carved out of a single piece of white alabaster. This chair, which we'll show you in careful detail, it's made of wood, it's typical of its period. Well, there's no inscription of any kind on it, but since it was left in the tomb, there doesn't seem to be any doubt that it belonged to Tutankhamun when he was a little boy. It stands about as high as a first grader's desk. The wood is ebony, which the Egyptians imported from Nubia. It's inlaid with ivory. And you'll notice the little chair is encased in a glass display area. These are all the priceless treasures in the gallery where humidity can be controlled. The chair was placed in the tomb for the pharaoh's afterlife. And let me explain here that the Egyptian concept of a tomb is a place in which to live again in a serenity and joy unknown on earth. Death was not the end, but another beginning. A tiny sculpture in solid gold. For the first time, we see the body of the little boy. 
one recognizes in the exquisite chaste metal the vulnerability of a child, a very young child, already crowned Pharaoh of Egypt. This small alabaster chest contained an extraordinary and yet a very human remembrance. Two balls of hair wrapped in linen, some say a wedding contract. The Pharaoh was not over nine years old. To secure the throne, they married him at this age to a princess. Her name was Anke Senamen, the daughter of the beautiful Egyptian queen, Nefertiti. Here, forming the lid to a very elaborate box, is Tutankhamun's cartouche. A cartouche is an oval ring on which a king's name and other royal identifications are embossed. An oval nameplate. The bird and two half circles mean Tut. Reading to the left, the cross and circle mean Ankh, and the upper symbols, Amen. The name has a meaning, as did all Egyptian names. Amen is the name of Egypt's protective god. Tut Ankh Amen means living image of Amen. And within that cartouche-shaped box, Carter found some dazzling jewelry belonging to the young prince of noble blood. Earrings. Here they are, highly magnified. Can you make out the design of the mythical bird? There's the wings of a falcon fanned up to make a circle at the top, enclosing the head of a duck. It's made out of clear blue glass. You're looking at one of the rare surviving examples of the earliest man-made clear glass in all of history. And this glass was highly prized by the Egyptians for its luster and ornamentation, but Following the decline of the young king's dynasty, the art of glass making was lost for a thousand years. The Greeks and Romans had to invent it all over again. There's an ominous sign, a curse, on a tomb in Thebes. It reads as follows. As for anyone who trespasses on my abode, I shall drag out my corpse. The sun god shall loathe him, and his soul shall be destroyed forever. Now we'll speak of this curse and the treasure and the flowering of ancient Egypt before the clock chimes and the cobra makes further progress through your living room. The pressure on Howard Carter was intense. What other doorways in this tomb? What new treasure to be found? But Carter was a disciplined scientist. All objects were to be marked, wrapped, removed. Among the most venerable and recognized now as a masterpiece of design and craftsmanship is this, the throne of Egypt, wherein doth sit the majesty of kings. More than likely, Tutankhamun was crowned in this elegant ceremonial chair in some vast and airy temple of Thebes over 1,300 years before Christianity began. Egypt was a great power, gold and tribute poured in from the vassal states, filling the coffers, and Pharaoh's rule was absolute. Well, imagine now a very small and frightened boy, new to this throne. Perhaps he carries a little gold staff as he turns to sit down, and now he squirms on the seat, nine years of age. Surrounded by royal favorites, bodyguards, slaves, viziers, adoring subjects, prostrate before him. Each sign, hieroglyph, and object in this chair is a work of art. Among the legends on it are a hope for a long life. May the good God live, it says, son of Amen, king of Upper and Lower Egypt, beloved Tutankhamun, ruler. But destiny ruled otherwise. No long life for this ruler. In ten years he would die, God at nine, 
and a childhood already dissolving in the morning mist along the Nile. And one wonders, did his feet touch the floor? A golden shrine on a sled of silver, a sanctuary, a protection in the long journey after death. The entire surface is covered with scenes of royal life, all of it in gold relief. This small shrine stands only a little more than a foot high. Inside are the imprint of tiny feet. Carter presumed that a solid gold statuette of Tutankhamen stood here, stolen by those ancient robbers who pillaged the tomb. And on the walls and doors, a royal tapestry in gold, palace life, 3,000 years ago. scepter of the king. It is made of sheet gold beaten on a wooden core. The shaft is in the form of a papyrus flower, all of it embellished with cloisonne work, carnelian, turquoise, lapis lazuli, felspar, and glass. And the message under the frieze, a continuing faith in a life everlasting, living forever, beloved son of Amen. This is the head of a golden fan used by royal court attendants in processions and religious ceremonies. Here we see the young pharaoh in his chariot on an ostrich hunt. This is one of the really outstanding pieces in the collection, a dagger made of hardened gold, and it's highly decorated and ornate sheath embossed in high relief. We see here an ibex attacked by a lion, a calf with a hound biting its tail, a leopard, and a lion. Such golden daggers were reserved for royalty, and this one was found among the folds of the linen wrappings on Tutankhamen's mummy. The shaft is decorated with minute particles of gold and in a work of semi-precious stones. Here's a trumpet. It's often used by armies on the march to set the cadence. Herodotus, the Greek historian who traveled the Nile, spoke of such trumpets. He said they sounded like the braying of an ass. A golden buckle with the king represented as a warrior on his chariot returning from battle, a 10-year-old warrior. And so he was crowned, and they said of him in the marketplace, O glorious pharaoh, crops will flourish and cities rise. Did Tutankhamun smile at this because it was the royal custom, and did the supreme vizier tell him, finish your supper, Tutankhamun? <laughs> 